Now that I'm getting old, I'm a little hard of hearing. Did you say I gave the longest message of any elders in this church? Well, I'll try to live up to that, brother. You know, when your hearing starts to go, you don't always get everything straight. No, no, it's really an honor and a joy to be able to share the word of the Lord with you this morning. I really, uh, not a privilege that I take lightly, but I cherish, and uh, it's exciting to be able to be exposed to God's word together. And uh, I just really want to, uh, again, uh, encourage you to appreciate the words that the Lord speaks to us early in the service and to really take note of them. Uh, they're very significant things, and uh, we pray and trust the Lord to speak to us, and he does. And the Lord said to us earlier today in Psalm 81, he made a conditional promise to us, and he said, if you will listen to, my, if you will listen to me and obey my voice, I will quickly subdue your enemies under you. I will feed you with the finest of the wheat and satisfy you with honey from the rock. What a beautiful promise that the Lord gives to us in his word. He also spoke to us and said that despite that we worship him because of his character, because of who he is, not because our circumstances and our lives are going the way we want in the midst of the storm, we worship him. And um, He also spoke to us and said that in our own quiet, private places, in our homes, in our apartments, we worship, we uh, offer incense, and prayer, and worship to the Lord, and the Lord honors that. And I think truly the foundation of our corporate worship is our individual private worship and what we do in our prayer closets. And uh, he also wants us to use our, our talents and gifts and artistic abilities for him. So the Lord has said a lot to us already, and I just want to uh, continue uh, a little bit and, and add to that. And Speaking of powerful words from the Lord, if you were here last Sunday, uh, you heard an anointed message from my brother Lorenzo, and uh, he was sharing with us from Hebrews chapter 2. And if you were here, you heard him share that. And uh, just remember, I got So Lorenzo was sharing to us from, uh, with us from the second chapter of Hebrews. And he, say, he talked about three things that are true of our relationship with Jesus, who the Lord Jesus is to us. He is our king. We worship him as king. Uh, he is our redeemer the one who redeemed us by his blood. And he is our elder brother. And the Lord Jesus ministers to us in all of those three ways. It says in Hebrews 2 that he tasted death for all of us. And it said that it was fitting for the author, uh, for, for, for God to perfect the author of our salvation through the things that he suffered. So that's how the Lord brought us to salvation is because of what Jesus did for us. And uh, uh, Lorenzo, you're kind of a hard act to follow. But uh, I will try to build a little bit on the foundation that you laid for us so excellently last week. And, and we're going to be turning to Exodus chapter 28. So if you have one of these things, a Bible, uh, grab it. And we're going to be looking at a reading in just a minute, uh, the opening verses of Exodus chapter 28, which is where we are in our corporate reading today. It's been an honor and, uh, to walk uh, with you through the opening chapters of the book of Exodus. We have uh, quite a few more to go. It's got 40 chapters, but we are today in Exodus 28. We're going to read just the opening uh, verses of Exodus chapter 28 to start off with. And um, I, uh, so I am going to do your homework for you, but only the first part. So we're only going to read the beginning of Exodus 28. And, and you have to read the rest on your own. So, uh, and it will be, this stuff will be on the final. So you better, you better be paying at close attention. So Exodus chapter 28, I'm going to be reading there in just a minute. Before we open the scriptures, I, I wanted to ask you a question. How do you see yourself? When you look at yourself in the mirror, who do you see? We often define ourselves in terms of our roles. I'm a husband. I'm a father. I'm an engineer. Uh, I'm a teacher, I'm a student, I'm a grandparent. Uh, our roles, our relationships, that's how we define ourselves. That's how we, we evaluate who we are. And all of those things are good and those things are important. In the final analysis, the thing that counts the most when I sum up my life and, and who I am and what I'm doing here is how God sees me. It doesn't really matter a whole lot how you see me or even how I see myself. The only thing that really counts is how the Lord sees me. 
And I'm here to tell you this morning, the Lord sees you as a priest. The Lord sees you as a priest called to minister to him. And we're going to see that in Exodus chapter 28. The Lord sees us as priests. This is a theme, of course, that's, that runs throughout the scriptures. Um, and, but not all religions, and, and, not, and in the Christian church and not all times and places around the world today, um, has, have people understood that all of us are priests. There are some religions that teach that um, there are a few holy people who are called to have their lives set apart to serve God and to take holy orders, but the rest of us are just kind of laity. You know, and uh, we're, we can do kind of whatever we want with our lives and live, pursue our own personal goals because there are holy priests that, are ta that, are, that take care of worshiping God and, and serving him. But a, a really powerful thing happened during the Reformation, a lot through Martin Luther, also through John Calvin and other leaders who reminded the church of a, a very important theme, and it's called the priesthood of all believers the priesthood of all believers. Luther and Calvin didn't make it up. It's a theme that permeates the scriptures, that all of God's people are priests, the priesthood of all believers. And um, there are some scriptures about that that are really familiar to us. Uh, one, of the most, one of the ones that we know well, could, partly because we sing it, is from 1 Peter chapter 2, where the apostle says this, um, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, this is 1 Peter 2, 9, a people for God's own possession. That's who we are, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, people for God's own possession. In um, the book of Revelation, John's on the island of Patmos, and he has, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what that book is about. It's not about weird stuff that happens in the future. Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And many and John has many visions of the Lord Jesus. And one of the most beautiful and powerful is right in the beginning of Revelation chapter 1, verse 6. Uh, it's, it's Revelation 1, 6. And the apostles describes Jesus this way. Revelation 1, 6. He is the one who loves us, who released us from our sins by his blood, and who has made us to be a kingdom and priests to his God and Father. That's what Jesus did. We ought to be astonished and bowled over every day by, the, by what Jesus did for us when he loved us and released us from our sins by his blood. And the reason he did that was to make us a kingdom and priests to his God and Father. Of course, the idea of priesthood has its roots deep, deep in the Old Testament and, and almost every book in the scriptures directly or indirectly describes priesthood. We're really getting into it here uh, in Exodus, and uh, I'm, I'm glad that you've been reading along uh, with us about the priesthood in Exodus. And, and I'm going to read a few verses from uh, Exodus chapter 28. Now, these verses that we're about to read, the beginning of Exodus 28, um, focus on one particular component of priesthood, one part of priesthood that's, that's highly significant and I think often overlooked in the role of priests. And when I ask myself, what, what am I doing in the kingdom of God? One thing that never occurs to me very much is my clothing. What am I wearing? What do I put on? Is that an important part of being a priest? Most of my life, I've believed that clothing is totally unimportant, you know? It doesn't, as, as long as I get dressed in the morning, it doesn't really matter uh, how I dress. And um, when I was in ninth grade, I took a, a little bit of Latin in uh, junior high school. And uh, we learned a phrase in Latin class, vestus virum facet. Have any of you heard that before? Vestus virum facet. Anybody know what that means? It means clothes make the man. Thank you. Clothes make the man. And I thought when I was a teenager, that's ridiculous. You know, clothes don't make the man. It doesn't really matter what I, what I wear. And I, and I kind of felt that way until I read Exodus chapter 28, because this is the instruction that God gives to Moses. Bring near to me, bring, bring near to yourself Aaron, your brother. You're with me, Exodus chapter 28. Bring, 
God says to Moses, bring near to, to yourself Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him from among the sons of Israel to minister as priest to me. Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar, those are Aaron's four sons. You shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. You shall speak to all the skillful persons whom I have endowed with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister as priest to me. These are the garments that they shall make a breastpiece and an ephod and a robe and a tunic of checkered work, a turban and a sash. They shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, and for his sons, that he may minister as priest to me. Holy clothes, holy garments. This still begs the question for me, though, does God really care about what we wear? Does what I put on really make a difference? You know, when um, Samuel was sent by the Lord to the house of Jesse, Jesse the Bethlehemite, and uh, to anoint the next king of Israel. And uh, Jesse's sons were paraded before him. And um, the Lord speaks a, a warning into Samuel's ear. And he says this, man doesn't see as God sees. For man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. That's uh, 1 Samuel 16, 17. And I, you know, I thought, Boy, that's a great verse. In fact, I really like that verse. The favorite verse of all sloppy dressers. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. So it doesn't matter what we wear, right? Is that right? Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. So clothing doesn't count. If that's true, then why do we have Exodus chapter 28, verses 1 through 4? Why are they there? Aaron and his sons, you and I, called to minister as priests. Many, many tasks given to them, some of them very menial, some of them more significant. They, among other things, they had to be housekeepers and butchers and, and uh, do a lot of house cleaning and a lot of heavy labor, heavy work, killing animals and stuff like that. Um, lots of roles that were given to them. And you've got to dress appropriate to the task that you've been given to do. Let me ask you something. If, if, you, if your home was burglarized, and you called the police, and they came and arrived at your front door, and they were dressed in flip-flops and Hawaiian shirts, how would you feel? Say, would you guys please go away and send some real cops? You know, I've got a problem here, and you don't seem like you're ready to, to, to deal with it. You gotta wear and, and have the right uh, tools for, what, for the task that you have been called to fulfill. Now, as I read through the scriptures, Exodus and, and other places, there are two highly significant roles that I see that priests are called to do. And one of them is, is first and foremost and foundational. And the other is, is a corollary to that. It's, it's of secondary importance, but still vital. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about each of the two roles. And I'm gonna start with the second one, because I do things backwards. And the second, but to, to my way of thinking, the secondary role, but still vital, that priests have to perform, that Aaron and his sons, that you and I have to perform, is to be a mediator, to serve as a go between between the Lord and his people. A priest, a mediator, is someone who represents God to God's people and also represents God's people to him. And as, you read, as we read through the book of Exodus, we see Moses and Aaron fulfilling this role over and over again. And there's one passage I'd like to ask you to turn with me to. It's in Exodus chapter 19. So if you'd flip back with, your, with me in your Bible to Exodus chapter 19. We're going to look at this aspect of the role of the priests. Uh, mediators going between God and his people around verse 7 Exodus 19 7 give you a moment to turn there Exodus chapter 19 verse 7 uh, this is uh, among the instructions that Moses received from the Lord just prior to the giving of the Ten Commandments which occurs in the next chapter Exodus 20 so Exodus 19 7 Moses came and called the elders of the people 
and he set before them all these words which the Lord had commanded him. You see, he's, he's setting before the people the words of God. Verse 8, all the people answered together and they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. That's really easy, isn't it, you know, to, to pay a vow to the Lord and say, I'll do everything God tells me to do, no problem. You ever done that? It's a little harder to, uh, to fulfill than to make the promises. But so the people said, all the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. You see, he's almost like shuttle diplomacy, you know. He said, he's bringing God's word to his people and, and, and waiting and getting a response and bringing the, the word of the people back to the Lord. You and I are called to do that. Now, I don't know if you're feeling very sacerdotal, if you're feeling very priestly, but um, in, case you're, in case you're not, I just want to encourage you. I believe you are already doing this. And you, you should acknowledge what you're already doing as a priest. Let me ask you this. Are there people that you know that need God's instruction and God's encouragement and God's word? And do you, in your relationship with them, go to them and share words of scripture with them? Encourage them and say, and try to speak words from the Lord into their situation, sometimes sharing scripture or some insight that the Lord gives you. If you're doing that, you're, you're functioning as a priest. And when people are suffering and in need, people that you care about and needs that you become aware of, do you go down on your knees and, and, and bring them before the Lord and intercede for them and say, Lord, would you please move and would you intervene in these situations? If you're doing that, you're a priest. If you're doing those two things, that's being a mediator, being a go-between. The verse that we start off with in, in 1 Peter I notice that Peter does not say, if you're really, really holy person, and if you stamp out all sin out of your life and, and completely stop sinning, then you'll be a, a, a holy race and a royal priesthood. He says, no, we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood of people for God's own possession. The way G Jesus is described by uh, John in Revelation chapter 1, verse 6, he says, Jesus loves us. He released us from our sins by his blood. He has made us to be a kingdom and priests to his God and Father. The reason you're a priest, not necessarily because you feel holy, but it's because that's what Jesus made you when he released you from your sins by his blood. Do you see that in Revelation chapter 1, verse 6? If the, first, if the second most important part of priesthood is mediating, going, being a go-between between, between God's God and his people, then what's the first, the foremost, and the primary thing that priests have to do? Let's take a look back to, to the verses we start off with in Exodus, Exodus chapter 28. Turn back with me, if you will, to Exodus 28. I'm going to look at these verses with you again. This is what God said to Moses. Bring near to yourself Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him from among the sons of Israel to minister as priest to me. Aaron, Nahab, and Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. Just a quick question. Which one of those four, which one of Aaron's sons succeeded him when Aaron's time as high priest was finished? Anybody know? Eleazar. I'm giving out lots of gold stars today. Well, you know, if, if we go by birth order, which it sounds like we are, he's the third son. What happened to Nadab and Abihu? They were toasted, somebody said. Yeah, they, they offered strange fire. They burned incense to the Lord contrary to the command of the Lord, and, and the fire of the Lord leaped out at them, and they paid the price. So Eleazar succeeded his father and not, rather than Nadab and Abihu. So then going on, uh, so those are Aaron's sons in verse 2. The Lord further says to Moses, You shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. 
You shall speak to all the skillful persons whom I have endowed with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister as priest to me. These are the garments which they shall make. And he lists six specific garments, a breastpiece and an ephod, and a robe and a tunic of checkered work, a turban and a sash. And they shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, and his sons, that he may minister as priest to me. Is there anything in particular that jumps out at you from these verses that we just read? Is there any phrase that sticks out to you? What does it mean uh, to be a priest according to these verses? Why are these holy clothes so important? In verse 2, he says that they're for glory and for beauty. Now, when Aaron comes in front of me, I don't want him to be wearing, you know, a torn uh, blue jeans and a dirty t-shirt. He's got to look glorious. He's got to look beautiful. Psalm 96 talks about uh, worshiping the Lord and, and uh, coming before him and ministering to him as priest. And it, it says in Psalm 96, verse 9, it says, Worship the Lord in holy attire. Holy attire. You've got to have holy stuff on. And, but the King James Bible translates it with a beautiful phrase. It says, we worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. I love that description, the beauty of holiness, because holiness is beautiful. You and I have seen a lot of beautiful things in our lives. Uh, I've seen some beautiful waterfalls and uh, mountain vistas. And just recently, the Lord gave Karen and me an opportunity to to visit uh, the Sea of Cortez uh, off the west coast of Mexico. I saw some beautiful things there. I saw uh, gigantic gray whales leaping up out of the ocean and splashing back down. And um, marine bi biologists say, I don't know why they do that. But I think they're doing that to celebrate the Lord and uh, to just rejoice in, in God and worship him in that way. And, and on the other end, we saw a tiny little hummingbird called a Costa's hummingbird. And when the Costa turns toward the sun, all of a sudden, the males of feathers flame out in this gorgeous violet hue. And it's absolutely beautiful. There's some beautiful things in God's creation. To me, the most beautiful thing that I have ever seen with these eyes is the face of someone who is worshiping the Lord the face of someone who's worshiping the Lord. That's the beauty of holiness. That's the most beautiful thing that I've seen so far. So it goes on in verse three and it talks about the skill that's necessary to make these holy garments. It talks about the anointing, uh, the, the, the wisdom that comes from God to, to, to make these special consecrated holy garments. Six things that they need to, that Aaron and his, and his needed to wear, six specific garments. And, and all of these are um, for, for, for consecration, for holiness. He says, you put these things on to consecrate Aaron, that he may minister. The phrase that really jumps out to me from these verses is that at the end of verse one, at the end of verse three, at the end of verse 4, it says, Aaron may minister as priest to me. This, I think, is the most important part of priesthood. We are ministering as priests to the Lord. We use the phrase, uh, an audience of one. For whom are you living? For whom are you performing? For whom are you singing? Is it for an audience of one? We have been called to be priests to him. That's why Aaron had to be consecrated and wear special holy clothes, with to minister first and foremost as priest to God alone. Consecration. Now, I was thinking the other day, as I was putting these thoughts together about my brother Carl Dreer, and I know you're probably thinking it's kind of a dangerous road to go down, and it, you, you, at, at your own risk, and uh, that's true. But nevertheless, I kind of let myself travel down that road, and I was thinking about Carl. And, 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 and I've no, I noticed that the, he and I have um, several things in common. Uh, I mean, apart from the fact that we're both, you know, talented and good-looking, um, 
Uh, Carl and I, you may know, and I think I may have mentioned to you before, have the same favorite hymn. And uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful hymn. It's in the hymnal. You can look it up. It's written by a woman named Frances Ridley Havergal. And it goes like this. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. And then the, the writer talks about different uh, parts of her body. And she says, take my hands and let them move at the impulse of your love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages for thee. Take my, my voice and let me sing always only for my king. An audience of one, let me sing always and only for my king. That's what that hymn is about. We have a great Bible study that occurs here on uh, every other Wednesday evening. And uh, it's on the topic right now of eschatology. And uh, if you're missing it, you're missing it because it's a really great time in God's word. And uh, recently in, the, in, in our class, uh, we've been discussing the topic of the final judgment that climactic event which will close out the age in which we are living. Um, Jesus talks about it um, as he does so often with high, highly significant things. He talks about it in, 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 in terms of a parable and he describes in Matthew 25, starting around verse 35 and 40 of Matthew 25, the, the final judgment, the last judgment. And he uses a parable of a sheep gathering his flocks, or excuse me, of a shepherd gathering his flocks, because Jesus is the great shepherd, and he calls himself the Son of Man here, and he says that the Son of Man will gather together the sheep and the goats, and he'll put the, the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left, and he will say to the sheep, come, you who are blessed by my Father, Inherit the, the, the kingdom prepared before you, pre prepared before you before the foundation of the world. Is that an incredible thought? The Lord has prepared for you and for me, for us corporately, a kingdom before He even founded the world. He said, "Because I was hungry, and you fed me; I was thirsty, and you gave me drink to drink; I was naked, and you clothed me." I was a stranger and you invited me in. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And the righteous will respond to Jesus. The sheep will say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and, and, and feed you and thirsty and give you a drink? And when did we come to you? And you remember what Jesus said. He said, to the extent that you did it to these brethren of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. He did it to me. We know a guy in Monterrey, Mexico, whose name is Danny. And Danny and his team go out into the poorest parts of that city and they find children who are alone and hungry and thirsty and lonely and homeless, many of them. And they bring them to a place where they have love and where they have food and clothes and an education and a chance to, to get to know Jesus and live a, a productive life for him. The least of these brothers of mine. We also know a young woman who um, ministers to hurting broken women and uh, she's done it in Mumbai and also in Kabul and now she's operating out of Northern uh, Virginia and um, she, she, she ministers to women whose lives have been battered and broken and hurting in a variety of ways. And she ministers the healing from trauma and the love of the Lord Jesus and the gospel to people who are, women, who are, who are hurting. What are, what are Danny and Vera and others like them doing? They're ministering as priests to Jesus. And I can look all around this room and what I see is a bunch of folks who are wearing holy garments, people that are wearing holy clothes, people that are caring and that are ministering as priests to Jesus. And it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. 
In Revelation 19, among the many amazing visions that John has on Patmos, he had a picture, an image of the bride, the wife of the lamb. And it said he, was, he said it was given to clothe herself, and this is Revelation 19, 8. It was given to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. And that fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. These are the holy garments. Now the principles of, of the garments that uh, Aaron was, and his sons were given to wear aren't, don't just occur in the, verse, in the chapters that, uh, that we mentioned already in Exodus. They're uh, strewn and throughout the book of Exodus and they permeate the book of Exodus. And I just wanted to turn to um, another one with you. Uh, this is actually back in Exodus chapter 19. I looked at Exodus 19 before, but I'd like to ask you to turn with me, if you will, again in your Bible, uh, back to Exodus 19. And I want to look at another passage from Exodus 19, just before the part that we read before. Again, you'll remember that Exodus 19 is uh, instructions that God gave to Moses on Sinai, uh, just preliminary to the reception of the Ten Commands, the Ten Commandments. And um, in, in Exodus 19, verse 3, Exodus 19, 3, Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the sons of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings, brought you to myself. What a powerful metaphor of the Lord's destruction of Egypt and his uh, salvation of the children of Israel, how he bore them on eagles' wings, how he redeemed them. Brother Lorenzo was talking last week about the Jesus, our Redeemer, and he gives a, a powerful metaphor to start that out. And then he goes on in verse 5, and he says, "This Now then, in light of what I did, now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. A kingdom of priests, a holy nation. Exodus 19, verses 3 through 6. What a precious passage to read and to meditate on. And precious relationship that God establishes with us and with Israel, his own possession among all the peoples of the earth. It's incredible. A pre precious promises that he gives to us about what he's going to do. And of course, you recognize that this is the passage that Peter was quoting uh, in 1 Peter chapter 2. So not just in the old covenant, but also in the new. Peter flings wide the door open to priesthood. And he says, um, once you were not a people, now you're the people of God. He said you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, 1 Peter chapter 2. We can do that this summer. We can do that right outside these doors. We can proclaim the excellencies of the one who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. What a privilege to be able to proclaim that. Now, if you're like me, you probably have noticed that there are a few differences between priesthood in the Old Covenant and in the New. There's a, th a few things that we do, we do differently. Hey, Dave, I couldn't help but noticing that when you uh, came into the sanctuary this morning, you were not leading a bull or a goat with you to sacrifice on the altar. At least I didn't notice it. You forgot again. Did Ephraim and I have to do everything? Carl, I noticed that when you uh, mounted up, uh, up to the, uh, the platform to lead worship, you weren't wearing a turban. And uh, I didn't see a sash or, uh, or an ephod. I didn't check to see whether you were wearing a tunic of finely checkered work, but uh, I, I doubt you were. If we don't worship the Lord, with the same kind of exact holy garments that Aaron and, and his sons were commanded to wear, do we then come as New Testament priests to worship the Lord with nothing on? That would be kind of embarrassing. 
We have garments to wear. And I think that the place that they're described in the most detail and the most clarity for us are in the epistles of Paul. Paul tells us what garments we wear as New Testament priests. For example, in Romans chapter 13, verse 14, Romans 13, 14, you can look these up or note them, but these are important passages. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul says, and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lust. We clothe ourselves with Christ. We put him on. What righteousness do I have to come before the Lord and the minister as a priest? It's in Jesus alone, so I put him on. Paul also talks in Ephesians 4 and elsewhere about putting on the, the new self, putting on the new man that's been created in the image of God. Colossians chapter 3 is another great passage. Turn there with me if you have a minute. This is uh, Colossians chapter 3. Let's look at what Paul says we wear. Colossians chapter 3, starting with around verse 9. This is talking about how we used to be um, sons of, of, of disobedience, just like the rest of the people we used to walk in, their same, in, the, in that darkness. But um, we put aside anger and wrath. Uh, in verse 9, he says, You've laid aside the old self with its evil practices. Verse 10, Colossians 3.10, And you have put on the new self, who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. The putting on the new self. Skipping verse 11 for a moment. Verse 12, Colossians 3.12. So then, who, uh, as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone. Just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Verse 14, beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. These are some of the garments of the New Testament priest. We put on Jesus. We put on the new self. We put on a heart of compassion. Beyond all these things, we put on love, the perfect bond of unity. These are the things that we have been told to put on. The instructions that uh, Moses received about how Aaron was to be clothed and his sons to minister as priests are really repeated, and we'll see these as we continue to read through the book of Exodus. And just to give you uh, one more passage to, sh to show this uh, in regard to the, the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, uh, Exodus chapter 40. Uh, I don't know if you want to turn there with me, but uh, at the very so we've we've by that by this time in a few weeks we will have worked our way all the way through the book of Exodus, and so in, in, in Exodus chapter forty, starting with verse twelve, Exodus forty, twelve toward the very back of the book, you'll you'll notice some similarities. Some themes are repeated and reinforced, and in regard to the tent of meeting, this is what. Uh, the instruction that Moses receives in Exodus 40, 12. Then you shall bring Aaron and his sons to the doorway of the tent of meeting and wash them with water. You shall put holy garments on Aaron and anoint him and consecrate him that he may minister as priest to me. There's that phrase, minister as priest to me. You shall bring his sons and put tunics on them and you shall anoint them even as you have anointed their father, that they may minister as priests to me, and their anointing will qualify them for a perpetual priesthood throughout their generations. So this isn't just a short-term thing. This isn't just a transient priesthood. This is what he calls a perpetual priesthood throughout their generations. And those generations have continued on all the way to us in the 21st century and throughout the scriptures, old and new covenants. And just one other passage that I want to draw your attention to, and it's I, at the, again, toward the back of the Bible in, in Revelation chapter 5. So, if you will, turn with me to the fifth chapter of the book of Revelation, Revelation 5. You know, this is the, a series of incredible revelations 
that John gets about Jesus and his character and his nature. And if you remember the scene in heaven in the fifth chapter of the book of Revelation, you'll remember that John sees God seated on his throne and he sees in, in God's right hand a book, which we find out is the book of life. And it's sealed up, written on the inside and on the back. And one of the, uh, one of the angels, a strong angel in heaven, proclaims a question. And he says, who is worthy, this is verse 2 of Revelation 5, who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? And no one was found worthy. And John begins to weep greatly. Verse 4, takes this really hard. He's pouring out a fountain of tears because no one was found worthy to open the book and to look into it. Then one of the elders comes up to, the, to, comes up to John and he says, cut it out, John. Actually, it doesn't literally say cut it out. And if you're reading in the NLT, you might say that. But what it actually says in verse 5 of Revelation 5, the elder says to him, says to John, stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has to overcome so as to open the book and break its seals. So John's looking for a lion, right? But that's not what he sees. Instead, he sees a lamb standing as if slain. The Lamb of God, standing as if slain. And in verse 7, he comes and takes the book out of God's hand. And when he takes the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders felt fall down before the Lamb. And uh, they sing a new song. And these are the words of the song of the Lamb. Revelation 5, 9. Worthy are you, Jesus, to take the book and to break its seals. For you were slain, and you have purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Let's never get used to this amazing thing that Jesus has done for us. It ought to just fill us with gratitude every morning when we wake up. Jesus purchased for us with his blood from every tribe, every tongue, people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God. They will reign on the earth. That, my brother, that, my sister, is how God sees you. How do you see yourself? Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for the way you've spoken to us in this service, Lord. And Lord, for the promises that you gave to us. You said if we would listen to you and, and obey your voice, that you would feed us with the finest of the wheat, that you would quickly subdue our enemies, that you would feed us with honey from the rock, from Psalm 81. Thank you for speaking that to us. In other words, you've spoken to us. Lord, thank you for reminding us last week from Hebrews 2, Lord Jesus, that you are our King that you are our Redeemer, that you are our big brother. We worship you, Lord Jesus. And uh, Lord, I just ask you to give me and, and each of my brethren here, Lord, the, 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 the clarity, the wisdom, the spiritual insight to, to see ourselves, not the way other people see us or even as we see ourselves, but to see ourselves as you see us. And Lord, truly to, um, to learn to minister as priests to you.